Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. It is now clear that for many of our elected leaders, it's not even worth having a country if that country comes with real borders. The federal government, you may have heard, is on the brink of shutting down tomorrow if Congress can't come to an agreement on funding it. The main stumbling block remains DACA. That's, of course, President Obama's program that gives work permits to illegal immigrants who came here as minors. Almost all Democrats and many Republicans are pushing for an amnesty for DACA recipients, as well as for millions of other illegal immigrants. There's a striking fanaticism to their position. Illegal immigrants must be kept in this country at all costs, no matter what. For Democrats, it's understandable because the calculus is simple. Having abandoned the concerns of the middle class here, they need millions of new voters and they need them fast. Otherwise, their party risks becoming a permanent minority. Replacing ungrateful citizens with obedient immigrants is their only hope. Every Democrat who's thought it through for even a minute knows this well. They can't say it in public, though, because obviously it's horrible. So instead, they're trying a new talking point. Illegal immigrants are terrific people, every single one of them, far more noble and law-abiding than you are. How dare you complain about their presence? You must be a bigot. The one problem with this line of argument is that it's vulnerable to facts. But until recently, there really were few reliable numbers on crimes committed by illegal immigrants. And this allowed Democrats to pretend that every person who sneaks across our border goes on to become a heart surgeon or a member of SEAL Team 6. We've got the data now, and it turns out, surprise, surprise, they've been lying to you. In the border state of Arizona, for example, illegal immigrants commit two and a half times as many murders as American citizens do. They're almost 50% more likely to be in gangs. They commit more armed robbery and more sex crimes against children. Overall, they're about twice as likely to be convicted of crimes of all kinds, non-immigration related. And that's just in one state. In California, an illegal alien named Luis Brasamantes murdered two police officers. Brasamantes had been deported from this country multiple times. In each case, he came back, thanks to politicians who have zero interest in keeping people like him out. In court this Tuesday, Brasamantes bragged about his plans to escape from prison and murder more. So illegal immigration divides the country, it lowers wages for those who can least afford it, and in some cases it literally costs Americans their lives. So why are we doing this? Because it's our moral duty. That's what our leaders are telling us. We have to. That's who we are. Just days ago, the Senate's most celebrated moral philosopher, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, spoke for the country's entire ruling class when he explained the rationale for his views on immigration. Diversity is our strength. Now, you've heard that phrase before, obviously. You hear it every day. In effect, it's our new national motto, soon to replace the outdated and, in fact, polar opposite sentiment, e pluribus unum. Diversity is our strength. It'll be in our currency before long, trust me. But what exactly does it mean? You may have noticed that nobody ever bothers to explain exactly what it means. And more pressingly, is it true? The less we have in common, the stronger we are? Is a marriage stronger when spouses have radically different beliefs? Are you closer to your kids when you share no common points of reference? Do you speak the same language as your best friend? Could you be best friends if you didn't? These are important questions, given that our leaders are radically and permanently changing our country, wholly on the basis of their faith that diversity is, in fact, our strength. Maybe we should have talked this through ahead of time. Somehow we didn't. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy tried to start that conversation today, and here's part of what he said. We did not survive, grow, and become the most powerful civilization in human history because we are focused on our diversity. It is not our differences that makes us stronger. It is our unity despite our diversity. Unity in past, of principles, and of the purpose that brought us out of many unto one. In other words, diversity isn't our strength. Unity is our strength. Don't the left lie to you. That doesn't mean we have to look alike. It doesn't mean we have to come from the same places. It does mean we have to share common beliefs. Otherwise, we'll hate each other, and the whole enterprise will fall apart. That's true in families, it's true in friendships, and it's true in countries, too. You already knew that because it's obvious. Our leaders spend most of their time denying it. They're lying to us. Kate Gallego is a Phoenix City Council member. She's running for mayor in that city, and she supports the continuation of DACA. She joins us tonight. Kate Gallego, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. 
Thank you so much for having me. So um, trying to think through how legalizing people who are here illegally helps American citizens. And in Arizona, we have some data on this because it, the state passed, as you know, one of the toughest anti-immigration laws in the country in 2010. And the effects of that have been studied. And here's what they showed. There was a short-term labor shortage, obviously. People here to work. They can't work. There was a labor shortage. But over time, automation made up for it. And wages went up for American workers. Costs, meanwhile, went down. Prison costs went down. Education costs went down dramatically by hundreds of millions of dollars. So given that we know that, why does it help the economy to legalize people here illegally? Right now, the city of Phoenix is the fastest growing city in the entire country. We mm -hmm. added more people in 2016 than on any other city, and we're constrained by our workforce right now. We just had some folks from the home building industry come into the city of Phoenix and say, we could do so much more if we had a, a larger construction workforce. We could be creating jobs, we could building be building new affordable homes for people to live in, but we don't have the workforce we need. And they said that the point that they really feel like it's change was not having enough people through immigration. Yeah. We're well, a losing lot of employers, I bet they feel that are way. losing out. Yeah. Um, a lot of, no, a lot of employers make that case and they mean it. They want, obviously, cheaper labor. I think all employers do. Why wouldn't they? But if that's true, if more illegal immigrants make a place richer, then how many specifically do you think Arizona or Phoenix needs? How many illegals do you need in your city to make it richer? Would more be better? How about 10 million? Would that make it even richer? Right now, we are desperately concerned about our DACA recipients who are in our city. Arizona has 28,000 DACA recipients who have been great members of our community who went to our high schools, were educated here. We've been investing in them for years. Now they're ready to give back, and we're worried about their future right now. Our Republican governor has stepped up and said they're an important part of our economy. We want them to stay. Um, right. Makes no, no, you, no, but you just, you just said that. I, mean, I, I just want to get to the nub of it, though, because I think it's a big deal. I mean, once you legalize people, they vote, they bring their relatives, it, it changes the place, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, but we should be clear about the effects, I think. I think you'd agree. So if bringing in more people illegally and making them citizens makes you more prosperous, then why wouldn't you bring in 10 million and become really, really rich? Would that work? Immigrants have been amazing contributors to our community. If you look right? at some of the data from Forward.us, Mark Zuckerberg's organization, oh, yeah. so many of the entrepreneurs who've built our tech economy came here through immigration. And we right. in Phoenix are desperate for more how people many, in engineering how many and tech, computer How science. many big tech companies are, are, were started by people from Central and South America, Latin America? So uh, right now I'm sitting in Phoenix, Arizona, very close to a company called Fortis who was, that was started by a gentleman from Panama. It's uh -huh. one of our top engineering uh, companies in, in this community, and they actually are one of our largest employers of at-risk veterans, which so, is but, a wonderful but, success I, story. I bet, I bet he's a great guy and the company's great, but how many big tech companies were started by the immigrants that you're talking about since you brought it up? How many? If you, I mean, if you look at, we have so many success stories in this community, and some of them have gotten national attention. Okay. Um, so I just want to be, because it's a big, with respect, I mean, look, I'm not attacking immigrants. I like immigrants, and I'm sure a lot of these people are great people. But people who live here, who are born here, or citizens, have a right to know the effects of this. So how many is the optimum number? If bringing in people illegally and giving them citizenship makes you more prosperous, what's the number, the ideal number of people we should give citizenship to? Our country and our community was, was built by immigration, okay, you're and we have so many stories okay. in this community. So I know stories, but I'm looking for facts, and I think it's fair to ask for facts. So John Lott, who's a researcher, a social scientist, got a hold of the conviction numbers, which the government of the state of Arizona has hidden from the population, because it's lying to the population about the effects of immigration, as you know. And he found that illegal immigrants in the state of Arizona were more than twice as likely to commit murder and overall far more likely to commit crimes of all kinds, not immigration crimes, but violent and property crimes. So given that, those are facts, how can you reassure the residents, the legal residents of Arizona of all backgrounds that this is good for them? I don't understand. We and cities throughout our community have seen great success stories when people feel like they can work with the police department and there's trust. So we've had folks who 
um, did not have legal immigration status, but were willing to work with our police department and have been very important in helping us, particularly with drug-related crimes. Okay, but but, but do you acknowledge? Safer. Are you do you acknowledge the reality of what I just said? So this study, which got a hold of Arizona state numbers, which I think are legitimate, says that people illegally in Arizona are far more likely to commit serious crime. Do you not believe that? Are you just ignoring it, or what's your response to that? So I just received the arrest and crime data from mm -hmm. the last calendar year, 2017, for the city of Phoenix. And right. that wasn't what we found in the city of Phoenix. Unfortunately, violent crime was led by people who live here and who were but that's born not, here. that's not the question. And were people who were there illegally more likely or less likely to commit serious crimes in the city of Phoenix? Are you really saying they were less likely? I don't think that's what the numbers show. Our 2017 numbers tell a very different story than the story that that researcher is telling you. So are you saying, just to be totally clear, because we're almost out of time, are you saying that you've seen numbers that in the city of Phoenix, people here illegally were less likely to commit serious crimes than citizens? Is that what you're saying? I just want to get you on the record. I'm saying com we need comprehensive immigration reform, and oh. it will help Oh, oh you're slipping out of the question. I, I'm asking a very simple question, and you're not giving me a real answer, and I think that tells the whole story. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Democrats apparently realized that cutting off paychecks for military servicemen on behalf of millions of people here illegally might be a hard sell to voters. For months, we've been hearing that the government could shut down if Republicans refuse to continue DACA without any concessions. In November, for example, Congressman Luis Gutierrez bluntly said, we want a clean dream act in return for funding the government. In other words, just give them amnesty. Just a week ago, the Washington Post was totally unambiguous on this question. Quote, the thorniest issue, they said, holding up funding agreement was Democrats' demand that DACA recipients be protected. Everyone knew that. No one denied it. And yet, oddly, with the shutdown imminent, Democrats are abruptly changing their story. The issue they say now is health care, somehow. Today, Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi said the real issue is that the Republicans won't permanently extend the CHIP program, that's the federal health insurance, Quote, this isn't about dreamers, she said during a press conference at the Capitol. This is about what isn't there to help meet the health needs of the American people. Does anyone really believe that? We'll answer that. No, no one believes that because it's not true. Well, America isn't the only country with a major political split over the question of who comes in and under what circumstance. It's not the only country where its leaders baldly lie to its own people about the effects of that immigration. Yesterday, for example, in Sweden, a police station was hit by a grenade attack. That's more common than it has been. Explosive attacks have, well, exploded in the past few years, as Sweden has welcomed a massive number of immigrants into its once famously placid society. This has caused a lot of effects, some of them political. We recently spoke to a man called Hanif Bali. He's an Iranian immigrant to Sweden who, maybe unlikely as it is, has become a leader, a celebrated one, in the push for tougher immigration laws there. Watch. What is the problem with Sweden's immigration system now? So there are many problems. It's very hard to define one, but the biggest problem is the amount of immigrants that are coming in. Uh, in the last couple of years, we have taken in about 250,000 uh, asylum seekers. And for comparison, that, that would be like uh, America taking in about eight or nine million uh, asylum seekers. This is people that Sweden provides housing, um, health care, schooling, uh, and all these big, a lot of these expensive services that the Swedish welfare system uh, uh, gives to people. And this has created, of course, a lot of huge costs in the short run for the Swedish system. But also, when we look at long term, what we're seeing now with crime and poverty is the effects of having a very lax migration system uh, for 10, 15 years ago. And what we're seeing now with, with uh, basically ghettos and uh, street gangs, which is a phenomenon that haven't been never even heard of in Sweden, uh, and also uh, jihadists uh, traveling abroad, etc. These are problems that are new to Sweden. And Sweden's system is not capable of, you know, it's not capable and it's not designed to handle these problems.
for example, in unemployment, I mean, in 2006, about 20% of uh, people unemployed were, were immigrants and foreign-born. Today, that number is up to 60%. So you are an immigrant from a Muslim family, and yet you've taken a hard line against Muslim immigration, mass immigration from uh, Muslim countries. What's the response been to you? If we want to help people, and that is truly what we want to do, you cannot put so much pressure to the system that the, uh, that the system collapses under its own weight. And the response I've been having, to, uh, because I'm you know, merely putting this statement out that's saying, look, there's a limit to how my, many people you can, you can take in, uh, has been to call me basically uh, uh, Uncle Tom, a house nigger. I've been compared to Dr. Mengele, you know, the, 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 and this is not from random people on the street. These are people who have prominent posts in, in, in parties, in, in the left, in newspapers. And, and this is, of course, because I don't, you know, I don't tell them the, the wishful thinking that they uh, want to hear. Yes. Well, we're very familiar with that in this country. You're a brave man, and we wish you luck. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. That man could be the next prime minister of Sweden. Nancy Pelosi says the Republican Party wants to foist something repulsive on America. So repulsive, probably not going to describe it on the air tonight. She says she might back a government shutdown in response. Mark Stein here to clear the air. Congress is on the brink of a shutdown literally tomorrow. Nancy Pelosi won't admit that because that would be admitting the Democrats are shutting the government down because Republicans refuse to legalize people here illegally. She's claiming Democrats want to shut the government down because the Republican Party is trying to do something repulsive. Here's her explanation. This is like giving you a um, bowl of doggy do, put a cherry on top and call it a chocolate sundae. This is nothing. Ugh. Meanwhile, over at CNN, Chris Cuomo says the Republican Party is guilty of the horrifying sin of vilifying people who snuck into our country and are demanding rights and money. Here he is. You guys have a pretty intentional effort to make illegal immigrants, as you call them, monsters. You put out this DHS report today that fictionalizes the risk of terror that is represented by people who come into this country illegally. We understand that that's against the law. We understand that it has to stop, but why make them all into villains? Mark Stein is an author and columnist and an actual thinker, and he joins us tonight. So Mark, when people like the guy we just showed put air quotes around the phrase illegal immigrant, what does that mean? Are you not allowed to admit that they're immigrating illegally? Yeah, I think he doesn't recognize that category. What's, what's interesting is that both he and Nancy Pelosi and others uh, on that side of the aisle are getting ever more explicit uh, in their preference for illegal immigrants, well, so-called, as he would say, over uh, American citizens. He, he said, Chris Cuomo went on to say that the real problem is white supremacists in America. They're the real monsters, not these nice, hard-working, illegal immigrants. Uh, and that may be well and true. I mean, for the purposes of argument, let's just say he's right. It's irrelevant. Uh, the white supremacists are American citizens. Uh, the illegal immigrants are people who shouldn't be here. And every the, the organizing principle of nation states is that they're organized on behalf of their citizens, whether their citizens are cheerleaders or, uh, or, or white supremacists or whatever. You're stuck with them. Uh, and this preference that Nancy Pelosi and Chris Cuomo uh, and increasing people have for actually importing a class of citizen that they prefer to the ones they're stuck with is actually very revealing. But how can you lead a country whose population you despise? I mean, would you be a good parent if you hated your kids? Would you be an effective officer if you didn't care about the safety of your men? I mean, doesn't that kind of prima facie show that you're not ready to lead if you don't love the people you're leading? 
No, I mean, you you said what about parents and kids? Uh, every family, uh, I, I think it was Malcolm Mugridge uh, who said that friends are God's apology for relatives. In other words, you pick your, your friends, you're stuck with your relatives. Uh, the, the Democrats are getting very close to saying that foreigners are God's apology for Americans. Uh, exactly Nancy Pelosi right. has explicitly said uh, that we should thank uh, the parents of these so-called dreamers, these DACA people, for bringing them here illegally. Uh, and in fact, to go back to what your Swedish guest was saying, uh, you know, whatever the economic benefits, which are minimal and are not evenly distributed, the cultural transformation, which is what's happening in Sweden, other parts of Europe, and is what's happening in Arizona too, uh, that's forever. In Arizona, a majority of the grade school children now are Hispanic. That means Arizona's future is as an Hispanic society. That means, in effect, the border has moved north. And the cultural transformation outweighs any economic benefits that that lady was talking about. It's at the very least bewildering for people who grew up here, and that's real. I don't think you have to be animated by hate or anything to say, you know, no. maybe I should have some say in what, how my country evolves. Mark, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Tucker. More evidence signs that the Las Vegas shooter, Stephen Paddock, may not have acted alone. Not a conspiracy theory. There is evidence of that. Tonight, one person fresh off walking the crime scene has news on that investigation. Our continued look at that continues next. Shooting, the worst in modern American history. Still many mysteries and some new developments in that case. Just two days ago, a lawyer for the Las Vegas police indicated new charges could be forthcoming. Odd, since the only suspect is dead. Detectives, though, saying very little. Catherine Lombardo was an attorney representing the victims of Las Vegas. She joins us along with Republican Congressman Scott Perry of Pennsylvania, who says he's got concerns about how this is going. First to you, Catherine. Um, what do you know? Yes, we had court uh, two days ago. It was the hearing for the press uh, where they have um, they asked the court to release the search warrants, uh, the affidavits, and all of the returns, right. which means all of the evidence, right? And so um, what we heard was quite shocking and quite surprising. Now, you have to remember that Sheriff Lombardo with the Las Vegas Metro uh, Police has told us at his uh, briefings that, that Stephen Paddock was the lone shooter. He was the only shooter. However, at the hearing, we heard two things. One, that there will be no indictments coming for any murder or shooting. However, they are investigating other charges and crimes. They wouldn't say who. They wouldn't say what. The entire courtroom took a gasp and looked up and went silent for a second. Even the judge reacted, and the judge said something like, okay, without telling me who or what, are you saying to me that there will be other charges forthcoming? And the lawyer for the police said, yes, there are other charges being investigated. The judge pressed him on that, and he said within 60 days. So what the judge did was she asked him for further supplemental briefing to explain to her right. what, what that contains, who it is, what it's about. You see, we're asking, and the press, the press is asking, for the, uh, the documents, the evidence to be released since there is no ongoing criminal investigation. Well, that would, that would be nice and answer basic questions such as how is an interior door locked inside the hotel suite? Congressman, you're the only member of Congress I'm aware of who's taken a public position asking questions about this. What are your questions? Well, um, I smell a rat like a lot of Americans do. Nothing's adding up. It's been four months, as you said. We don't even, the man's dead. They said he's a lone gunman, lone shooter, yet we can't get the autopsy results. But even more troubling than that, recently I've been made aware of what I believe to be credible evidence or credible information regarding potential terrorist infiltration through the southern border regarding this incident. Terrorist yes, sir. connections. Yes, sir. Okay, so what's the outline of that? What would that well, they could be, well, let's, let's face it, ISIS twice before the attack. ISIS warned the United States that they would attack Las Vegas, by, I think, in June and August. And then after the attack, claim responsibility four times. Meanwhile, the local law enforcement investigative services are telling us there is no terrorist connection, lone gunman. Something, again, something's not adding. Well, that's part of my confusion. Catherine, can you just confirm that this investigation is still being overseen by state and local authorities rather than federal? 
That's right. The FBI and the Las Vegas Metro Police Department have been conducting the investigation. Uh, we've seen no evidence of a terrorist attack, and I will ask, with all due respect, Congressman, unless you have specific evidence to back that up, it seems a bit irresponsible to make that allegation. So if you do, or make that assertion, if you do have any evidence of that, I'm asking you right now to share it with us and tell us what that is. My well, clients, the victims, to... all 22,000 yeah. people have right. been waiting and waiting and waiting Got it. Let's, let, let's, so... let the, let's let the congressman respond to that. I, I, we've all been waiting. I'm waiting, too. Like I said, nothing adds up, but I'm just telling you, I have received what I feel to be and believe to be credible evidence of a possible terrorist nexus, and we're going to have what to wait it? until until that it? situation develops. So, uh, so Kathleen See, Congressman said, a, they, hold on, another, hold on, so, 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 that, so that for one sec. I'm not taking hold. a position on this either way, but I want to get, I want to dig down a little bit here. If that is your belief, does Congress have a role to play in this? I don't know that Congress has a role, but I think who, who does have a role is the National Counterterrorism Center. And if ISIS claims, if ISIS warns about an attack and then an attack occurs and then claims responsibility after the fact, right. it seems to me that at a minimum they should have some portion of the investigation to clearly debunk that claim. And yet it hasn't happened. Okay, so tomorrow uh, we're unfortunately out of time, but we will be taking a press conference um, tomorrow out of Las Vegas by the investigators. Hopefully we're going to learn more, and I hope we speak to both That's of you right. again on this. Yes. Thank you both very Thank much. You. A powerful lobbying group wants to roll back a lot of the Republican Party's recent tax cut for the middle class. We invited them on to discuss their plan. Well, CNN doesn't like America's government very much, which you'll quickly learn if you watch that channel, not that we'd recommend it, obviously. But that doesn't mean CNN doesn't like foreign governments. Boy, do they. Ever see their overseas programming? It is packed with unfiltered propaganda from various authoritarian regimes around the world, regimes that CNN presumably has business deals with. Consider CNN's relationship with Turkey. Now, nominally, Turkey is an American ally. It's a member of NATO. Yet the Turkish president, Erdogan, routinely attacks the United States in far harsher terms than, say, the government of Russia ever does. Just three days ago, President Erdogan accused this country of forming a 30,000-strong terrorist army in Syria to attack Turkey. Huh? He's also said it's, quote, very clear the U.S. supports ISIS, and he says he has video evidence to prove that. Now, that's lunatic rhetoric, and it's also dangerous. Yet no matter what he does or says, President Erdogan can rely on totally sympathetic coverage from CNN Turk. That's CNN's network in Turkey, its Turkish broadcast outlet. CNN Turk broadcasts every Erdogan speech in its entirety, even as it denies a platform to Turkey's increasingly besieged opposition parties. Now, the network, CNN Turk, accused an American professor with no evidence at all of helping to orchestrate a failed 2016 coup against President Erdogan. That's a claim that echoes precisely one of the Turkish government's most fervent talking points. One informed independent Turkish journalist says that CNN, quote, amplifies the hateful and xenophobic narrative of the Erdogan regime. The question we think might be interesting to get an answer to is, how much is CNN making in exchange for spewing one-sided authoritarian propaganda on behalf of a hostile foreign power? We contacted CNN to find out. We have not yet received an answer, but of course we'll let you know when we do. If you're a middle-class conservative, you probably grew up thinking the Chamber of Commerce was on your side, standing up for small business, pushing back against pointless regulation and faculty lounge socialism. That's probably the Chamber of Commerce you remember. Well, here's an idea from the new and definitely not improved Chamber of Commerce. Higher gas taxes. In order to fund federal infrastructure spending, the Chamber of Commerce is pushing an additional 25 cents a gallon fee on gasoline. That's more than double the overall federal gas tax. So who exactly would pay that tax? Not rich Hillary voters in cities. They take car services, Uber, or ride the subway. Not the poor. They don't drive much. Nope. The people who will pay this tax that the Chamber is pushing and who will feel the pain of it are middle-class Americans who drive to work. So if you make 60 grand a year and commute more than 10 miles to your job, this is going to hurt you. Does the Chamber of Commerce care about that? We invited them on this program to explain themselves. They declined. Maybe they were exhausted from lobbying for that massive corporate tax cut last month. We'll keep you posted. Time for final exam. Leland Vittert, who defeated Shannon Bream, is back. Will he keep his winning streak alive? And can you outperform our heart?
hardened news professionals in summing up the news of the week. We'll be right back. Time now for final exam where we pit two hardened news professionals against one another in a gladiator style match to see who's been paying more attention at work this week. Last week, you'll remember that America's News headquarters host Leland Vittard ended Shannon Bream's legendary nine-match winning streak. Can he start a streak of his own tonight? That's the question. His challenger, Fox News Headlines 24-7 reporter Carly Shimkus, the pride of New York City. They join us both tonight on set. Not even close to nervous. Are you ready? (laughs) You're close to nervous. I love it. Okay. Feeling confident. Are you? Do you know the rules? Let's refresh. Here they are. Hands on buzzers. I'm going to ask the questions. The first one to buzz in gets to answer the question. You have to wait till I finish asking the question before you buzz in. Each correct answer is worth a point. If you get it wrong, you lose a point. Best of five wins. Are you you ready? Yes. Okay, good. All right. There we go. Question one. North and South Korea will join forces in the Winter Olympics next month. The two countries have agreed to come together to create a single team for which women's sport? Carly. Figure skating. Figure skating. To the tape we go. What will be a very rare sight during next month's Winter Olympics, North and South Korea agreeing to form a joint team and march under one flag. They'll play together, too, in the United Women's Ice Hockey Team. So our judges have ruled that just because it's on ice skates, it's not the same. I think it should. I think we should do a half point. <laughs> no. Can that be a new I rule? Say, look, I'm, I'm not in charge here. We've got a room full of accountants. Yes, we could, you know, brainstorm here and think Unfortunately, we can't count that. All right. Nice try, though. Thank you. Question two. You're about to see an image of a car dangling off the second floor of a dental office. Crazy dash cam footage of that incident went viral on the internet this week. The question is, how'd the car get there? Carly. Okay. A little bit of a backstory. The guy was arrested. He got, received a DUI. He flew over the median and uh, because of the trajectory, ended up in the second story of that dental office. Wow, that's quite an Everybody, answer. Everybody, I believe, walked uh, away let's, okay. let's, let's see if the tape reflects that to the tape. This happened in Santa Ana. Look at that. They hit that medium, and then the car, as you saw, went airborne. Oh, look at that. And it landed right into the second floor of a dental office. The car, there you see it, dangling right off that building. Isn't that unbelievable footage? I think he footage? Said the right word, median. And he walked away? Yeah. And well, everybody, there was nobody in the dental office, I believe, and he was, of course, arrested. Uh, but he's okay. Minor injuries. Amazing. Yeah. What a party story. Okay, so you are back to even. Right. We're at stasis, status quo, par, zero three, to zero. Three left. Question three. That's good to know. A medical briefing, a televised one for 58 minutes, revealed this week that the president is indeed healthy, but that didn't stop reporters from fat shaming him. When NBC producer asked Trump to prove his weight with a very strange request, what was it? Carly. Step on a scale. I don't believe that. Let's see. To the tape. A member of NBC's investigative unit tweeted out this gem, seeing a lot of skepticism over the idea that real Donald Trump weighs only 239 pounds. Would he step on a scale in public to prove it? Yeah, wow. he'll do that when reporters and anchors agree to public lie detector tests during their broadcast or after their broadcast. It's like a prize, uh, it's a like a prize good. match. There you go. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Okay, step on a scale. I would not have guessed that. Question well, four. Clearly. The temperature rises on the set. Uh-oh. Google, which is a large search engine company, mm-hmm. just released a new app. It has become popular. The app takes your selfie, a picture of you, and compares it to what? Portraits. Portraits. Um, yeah. So museum, famous museum uh, pictures, paintings, and portraits found in museums, I believe. Well, that's bizarre. Okay. Uh, does the tape reflect portraits, famous portraits in museums? Your image could already resemble a work of art on the walls of a museum somewhere. Oh, why do I look so old? Oh, my. This is located in the Arma Museum in Indonesia, and it is a famous, very famous oh, painting. fabulous. I like it. They're not even trying. This is such BS. Trying. I did mine on my own, and this is, is what angry? I came up with. It's just so <laughs> sad that you're so lonely and needy that you're going to let Google use your face. 
You know, I, the reason I, I, the reason I knew that is because I, I actually did it this week, mm. and the portrait I received that resembled me the most, I got a 60% match, was that of a bald man. Well, let's see. I think actually we did it too. And oh. Let's see what we came up with. Oh, is that me? That's oh, I don't know how I feel about man. that. We also did Leland. This is the poet Robert Burns. Oh, oh wow. Both he looks very smarter than he like Did they do you, Tucker? That's what I'm... Well, actually, I'm not aware of that. Yes, and that <laughs> He does have very nice hair, so you guys. I think they just took our like well, Fox ID bat <laughs> pictures <laughs> from the nineties. Yeah. All right, last question. Uh -oh. Wow, it's multiple choice. Actress and comedian Betty White had a birthday yesterday. She credits her longevity to her love of hot dogs and vodka, naturally. Yeah. How old is Betty White? Is she eighty-six? Mm. B. Is she ninety? Or C. Is she ninety-six years old? She is 86 years old. She's 86 years old, says Carly. To the tape we go. Very, very happy birthday for a very golden girl. Betty White, everybody. Turns 96 years young today. Did I get that right? No, I think oh. she's 96, off by 10 years. No! But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. prevent you from winning 1-0. Okay. It's the lowest score ever recorded, but still an impressive showing. Thank you, God. Congratulations. You. Very nice. I will say to you what Shannon said to me in the green room a couple of minutes ago. She said, you only have eight more championships to win before she will come back yeah. for a challenge. <laughs> Rising like Lazarus. Okay, so you win the coveted mouth breather mug. Oh, is that really for yes. me? Yes, you're I get the to most take it popular home? person in the break room. Oh, well, New York. this is fantastic. Congratulations. Carly Shimp is our than new. I just pride. I get a mug. <laughs> you do, and it's Very good dishwasher news. safe. Oh God. Thank you, Leland. Thank you. You were Glad the giant killer. Here. History will record that. Yes. Tune in next week for their final exam. Keep studying the news all week long so you can see how you do against our hardened news professionals. We'll be right back. You saw the accidental ballistic missile warning over the weekend, but that aren't the only shoddy things going on in the government in Hawaii. News coverage of the state's emergency alert office revealed that one of the office's employees keeps a computer password written on a post-it note on a monitor, and it's visible in the picture. Greg Gutfeld, co-host of The Five, his wife was in Hawaii during that false alarm, and he joins us now to express his horror and amazement at what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, uh, Elena called me uh, uh, right after it happened, and uh, she just, so the way she explained things, it was like a complete... It was crazy town. It was nuts. And she told me that if it was real, that she probably would die. And I said I would never marry again. I might live with a model, but I wouldn't marry. But isn't and, your wife already a model? No, no, no. She's a, uh, she's a designer. Uh, oh, okay. But uh, I said I would visit her wherever she was laid to rest, provided it was near the surf and some decent restaurants. What did she say? So those would be your last words to her. You know what's And they were I'm sardonic. Joking. I'm joking, <laughs> but I got to tell you. She was so lucky I wasn't there because she's pretty calm. I'm the kind of person in a disaster movie that the hero slaps. You know, get, get yourself together. I'm, that, I'm the guy that eats all the rations on the first day. And I'm not even that hungry. But Elena was very calm, and, uh, and it was not a fun experience. She, she watched mothers, you know, weeping over the phone about because they're, they're not going to see their kids again and she saw and and she saw families dragging their children crying it was absolute chaos but but so this is a sincere question though that's a profound experience yes. most people don't face imminent death in their lifetime exactly and people who do are changed by it i mean that's real was she changed by it do you think the state's going to be different i'm not joking at all no no you know i think do you think the state's different or do you think she's different the, the people who went through this i don't know because here's the big problem and i said this on the five we don't care enough about these events because nothing happened a close right. call is almost no different than it actually happening but as a human being we don't see it that way so it's almost a distant memory in the same way that we don't talk about vegas anymore right. vegas vegas didn't have a part two so we parted ways with that story and this story has no part two. We, we don't know what's going on right now, so we've moved on, and plus there's a lot of news going on. But I think this is a really, really important story. The Hawaii Ma Emergency Management, I mean, they put a, you don't put a missile notification menu you know, next to your Don Ho playlist. You know, you, this is serious no. business. You don't, just, you don't just reassign somebody. You got to look at the whole system. And, and as long as we, if we don't put pressure on, on this, 
it will go away and nothing will change. And I don't, they have to take this seriously. And uh, I mean, I, I talked to people, a, a lot of people who were there afterwards and they were, they, they had, they had changed. Because when you Good. have an event like that, you never forget that you thought your family was going to die. That's you right. You never forget that. And there's upside in that, actually. It puts things in it, perspective. I'm not making light of this. Yeah. It's horrifying. And I'm glad I didn't go through it. But I think there, there's, a, there's a blessing in there. Anyway, I'm glad great. I wasn't there. I would have embarrassed myself beyond belief. <laughs> I, 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 you, I, I don't I, know about that. I panic when I have gas. No, I would have, my wife would have left me if we had lived. Well, I'm and sure she'll be greatly her. improved. Elena was pretty great already. Greg Gutfeld, thank you for that. Good to see you. Good to see you. We're out of time, sadly. You can tune in tomorrow night at 8 to the show that is the sworn enemy of lying, pomposity, smugness, and group. Think you can DVR it if you're ready to dive into the technical aspects of that. Good night from Washington. Sean Hannity is right now. Hey, Sean. All right, Tucker.